Welcome to the American Institutes for Research. Um, we're so pleased to be holding uh, this event about STEM pathways and what our researchers have found and what it may mean for the world, and we're glad to have you here. I want to welcome the people who are online watching um, over the web, and then this will be webcast later and placed online so you can view it then too. My name is Elizabeth Grant. I'm a vice president in the education program and have the opportunity to work with our STEM team. So I have the opportunity also to welcome you and introduce them. Um, I want to start by mentioning our AIR team that did this research. I want you to notice their names. We've got Courtney Tannenbaum, Rachel Upton, Lori Bukaki kirk Clarice Haxton, Rita Kirstein, Chrissy Zeiser, and Andrea Berger all women in um, doing research. They have degrees in these fields and graduate degrees, and they are esteemed re researchers in these fields um, in this area of this science, technology, engineering, and math. And they are here exploring pathways. So they are a good example of what we want to see happen, getting more diversity into the STEM fields and certainly into research and um, other areas of technical um, study. I wanted to note that um, this is a fascinating topic for us at uh, AIR because of that, because of our interest in trying to grow STEM pathways and grow the talent that we have here in those areas as well as across the country. And we have an, a team that's dedicated and passionate about that, and you'll hear more from Courtney Tannenbaum, who has devoted much of her academic career to this study. The STEM pathways for people from diverse backgrounds is tough. You'll see today that um, not enough people from diverse populations are getting into advanced degrees and entering academia. Increasingly, women are entering STEM undergraduate degrees, but that increase, that growth, is not sustaining into graduate level uh, ac education or into postgraduate education or employment. Um, the few women who have transitioned in don't seem to get into the senior leadership positions in uh, the top-rated institutions. And um, women of all races and ethnicities are more likely to hold lower academic ranks and work at less prestigious institutions than men are. And it's a tough cycle, right? Because if we don't have people from diverse backgrounds, in those positions, we don't have role models for people from diverse backgrounds to, move, to look at and say, I can be in that position. I can move into that position. Um, and yet we know that uh, a diverseness of perspectives and a plurality of thought leads to creativity and greater learning. And really, the, one of the only ways we're going to keep up in STEM innovation is to create that blended thought that comes from having women in these fields and people from racial and ethnic minority backgrounds. So I'm excited about the opportunity to raise this as an issue and to have you here exploring this with us today. I want to start out by um, our now move to introducing um, Audrey June Williams, who we are very glad is here she, to manage our, our panel and lead us in this conversation today. Um, Audrey is a senior reporter at the Chronicle for Higher Education. She knows this field and, and writes about academia in her work and recently won a first prize for beat reporting um, from the Education Writers Association. So she brings a terrific perspective. I also want to thank Michael Foyer and Carrie Ann Rockamore for joining us on the panel today. We're excited to hear from them. Thank you again for joining us, and I'll turn it to Audrey. Good morning, and thank you, Liz, for that introduction. Uh, in my first official act as moderator, uh, let me really quickly, so that I don't forget, remind our online audience to follow at education underscore AIR to join the conversation and to send questions to our panelists using the hashtag STEM diversity. 
I'm really glad to be here today to moderate a discussion on diversifying STEM in academia. The hurdles that underrepresented groups face while pursuing an academic STEM career and what colleges and universities can do to help them overcome these obstacles is a topic that has received a great deal of attention over the years from academics, university administrators, federal agencies, think tanks, researchers, and journalists like me. Although I came to the Chronicle 13 years ago, I've only been writing about the academic workplace since 2008. One of the first assignments I had when I was new to the beat was to go to a conference called the Institute on Teaching and Mentoring. I had no idea what to expect from this meeting that is the largest gathering of minority doctoral scholars in the nation. But I thought, well, if nothing else, I'll be able to talk to people firsthand about their decision to earn a PhD and find out more about the sacrifices they made to go to graduate school and what they're doing to stay on track. Not everyone I met there was pursuing a STEM degree, but many of them were, and they had joining the professoriate in their sights. What I still remember about that meeting from my first time around is the conversations I had with graduate students in the STEM fields. They told me how great it was to be at the Institute on Teaching and Mentoring because it was a temporary respite from so many things that they were dealing with, like the isolation they felt at their institutions, the racial and gender discrimination they were battling on a pretty regular basis, and the never-ending struggle to achieve work-life balance as a PhD student. Six years later, my reporting still puts me in the position to talk with blacks, Latinos, Native Americans, and women in the STEM fields. And basically what I hear from them as they talk about their work is some variation of what those PhD students in Tampa told me several years ago. It's clear to me that what I'm hearing is part of a bigger picture that we're going to discuss today. A bigger picture where not enough women and underrepresented minorities pursue and complete STEM degrees. And when they do, they aren't likely to end up as a professor at a top research university like their white male peers. Many people would argue that the future of scientific innovation in this country and globally is at risk if the lack of diversity in the STEM fields continues. Now, because there are researchers in this room and other people who traffic in data for a living, I know better than to think that I can hold up my antidotes as, some, as proof that something's <laughs> amiss when it comes to diversifying the ranks of STEM faculty. So thank goodness Courtney Tannenbaum of the American Institutes for Research is here with data. Data is good. Courtney is a senior researcher at AIR where she leads her STEM work. Under Courtney's leadership, AIR will convene a series of panels made up of STEM expert researchers, practitioners, and other stakeholders to develop a 10-year vision for improving STEM education. Courtney is going to kick off our discussion today by giving a short presentation of research that paints a picture of the movement, and lack thereof, of underrepresented minorities and women through academic and career pathways. I think you'll find what Courtney's put together to be an excellent framework for today's panel discussion. Courtney? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am much shorter than I think I am going to. Let's see. Sit. OK. Um, well, thank you again. I look forward to um, starting off what I think will be a really wonderful discussion with all of you and with my fellow panelists. Um, I'm going to be showing these slides and moving through them relatively quickly so we can get to the really interesting part of this discussion this morning. Um, but these will be posted online and available to all of you. So. Um, don't think you're missing too much of the data if I don't dig into it during this 10-minute presentation. So um, as my colleagues were just saying, the disproportionate number of women in elite academic positions is troublesome for, for many reasons. It raises questions about the extent to which biases and stereotypes against women exist in the academic sciences and in those pathways, and especially women who have um, what I'll call here intersectional identities, so racial ethnic minority women, women who are mothers, women who hold other identities that are also um, can be marginalized and isolated in those pathways and in STEM academic departments. Um, not only, as my colleagues say, does it limit the, the availability of viable role models to rising female scientists, it can also hind it, it much it hinders efforts at engaging new generations of both females and males. There's lots of research to show that it's not just women and young girls who benefit from a diverse set of role models and female role models, but the broader population overall. Um, indeed, when women of all races, ethnicities, and family commitments engage in STEM pathways and reach these t elite academic positions, um, we see that they really they challenge new approach. They bring new approaches to research and innovation. They have uh, new perspectives, new experiences, and this includes racial ethnic minority women who may have different perspective and cultural backgrounds than women who are caring for young children and bring that perspective to their research and their work. Um, so we see. Uh, that women are especially stalled. These are data that look at the very first positions or the employment status of women PhD recipients who have just earned their degrees. So upon earning their degrees, we looked at 
how many PhD recipients have secured employment, so a definite commitment to work at, and it could be an, inst an academic institution or a non-academic institution or any line of work. We see that um, although the rates of employment or secured employment are relatively high, 70% and 65%, there is a higher um, rate of employment, secured employment among men than among women. We see that 5% difference. And what's really concerning is when you look at these women with intersectional identities. So the rate of secured employment at the time of graduation for minority women and mothers is just 59%. So for looking um, at the, among the women who actually have, or among the PhD reasons that have secured employment, the data are a little bit more promising. Women start down academic pathways. We're seeing that among new CM PhD recipients who actually have secured employment, um, there's actually more women than men, or higher percentages of women than men, that secure academic positions. Or this could be a postdoc position or a faculty position, but a position at an academic institution. So this suggests that there actually is a true pipeline and an opportunity for diversifying these sorts of pathways. Women are entering these positions. Um, and actually, the rate among mothers is highest. We see that 80% of mothers compared with 63% of fathers are starting in academic pathways. And, um, and so there is a true opportunity here if we can take advantage of it. And this just, um, you'll, this is a little bit hard to see on the screen, so I'm going to go ahead and skip this. But you'll have these slides. This just shows a little bit more detail about the data I just pre presented. But this good news about the academic pathways is also tempered with some bad or some troubling data. Although female graduates are moving into academic career pathways at higher rates than men, among those in academic pathways, larger percentages of male graduates than female graduates secured positions at research institutions. So these disparities against women's representation in the pipeline and pathways to the most prestigious academic departments, are, we are seeing them early in the career pathways. They're starting at the very onset of these women's careers. So you see that among. Um, among women, 76% of them with secured academic positions are at research institutions compared with 81% of men who have secured academic positions. And then when you look at mothers just and fathers, just 70% of mothers have secured such positions compared with 75% of fathers. And these are mothers and fathers of children who are five years of age or younger, where research says is the most um, impactful in terms of potentially disadvantaging career pathways. So now that we've examined the academic pathways, what's happening with those folks who are in non-academic careers? So if we look at, and these data are slightly different. These are still um, looking at STEM PhD recipients, but it's STEM PhD recipients, uh, not necessarily at the start of their careers, but ones who have earned their, their doctorates already. So among the broader population of STEM PhD holders, where are they in their careers? And these are, um, in terms of those uh, individuals who hold non-academic positions, but have um, earned STEM PhD recipients, and that are in, um, we see that they are working um, for those of the, uh, there's a low visibility of female STEM leaders in research and development, so research and development outside of academic environments. Um, among, CM, among these PhD holders with non academic careers, we see again these sorts of disparities in the types of perhaps visibility and representation in the research, in, in getting new research out there in STEM research. So we see that 61% of males in non academic careers are in uh, research and development, whereas just 46% of females are. Uh, we also find that males are more likely than females to hold management positions. So, uh, they're also not as visible in top management, non-academic, but positions that are in that are management where they're actually leading and doing the work of, of leaders. Um, and these results are particularly striking in the disparities between males and females. But some interesting findings do emerge when you take account of uh, males and females' race ethnicity. We're seeing some differences there. And again, that gets back to the importance of not just examining women and men as homogenous groups, but what happens when you start looking at their intersectional identities of race and ethnicity. So we see that black females are actually more likely than females of other races and ethnicities to hold management positions. And in comparison, what's interesting is that black males are notably less likely than males of other races and ethnicities to hold management positions. Interestingly, the reverse is true for Hispanics. We see that um, with Hispanics, the males are most likely to, among all males to hold management positions. And among women, Hispanic women are the, or Hispanics are the least likely to hold management positions. So data like these, we, ha we don't know what's really underlying them, but it kind of it, it, it does beg questions about what potential sociocultural factors may be um, contributing to these sorts of career patterns. So now we've looked at the academic and non-academic 
careers of um, STEM PhD holders, but these have all been STEM positions or identified as STEM positions. So what's happening to those folks that are actually leaving STEM or who are the people who are leaving STEM? And that means that they've earned a STEM PhD, but um, using fairly strict definitions of STEM occupations, um, where they're not in those occupations. They're, they've taken a different career pathway. So even just looking at this, if you look at overall, one in six STEM PhD holders leave STEM. That's a little bit surprising given that these are, these are PhD holders. They've spent a long time earning these STEM degrees, and now they're not working in what are defined as STEM careers. Um, so we see that uh, overall, like I said, one in six leave STEM, but there's a uh, more, there's some groups that leave STEM more than others. Blacks are more likely than other races and ethnic groups to leave STEM, uh, 21%. Uh, I don't know if these data are hard to see, so I'll read it. 21% compared with, 21% of black uh, individuals compared with 17% of whites and 14% of, per, of Asians and Hispanics who have earned STEM PhD holders are not working in STEM careers. And black women are most likely of all groups to leave. 22% of black females who hold STEM PhD, uh, PhD recipients are not working in STEM careers. So we've pretty much come full circle with these employment data. We first saw that women and racial ethnic minority are one of the groups, in addition to mothers of young children, to not be securing employment upon earning their degrees. And now we find that black women and racial and ethnic groups are the most likely to leave STEM careers. And that could be that because they've actually left them or because they never got down that pathway to begin with. We don't know. We don't have those data available. Um, so I think these data really set the stage for what I think will be a, a great discussion to think about here are the data, here are the numbers, but what are the factors that are contributing to these sorts of patterns and how might we, might we be able to resolve them? Um, the last slide in, in my slide deck uh, is on a slightly different topic, but I think a related one, and, and we have an issue brief that focuses on this. Um, it's not about the careers, but it is looking at, takes a closer look at the types of debt levels of PhD recipients by race, ethnicity. And I think when we talk about what might be contributing to the different kinds of pathways that uh, that STEM PhD recipients take, thinking about these sorts of other factors, not just the sociocultural ones, but um, the ones like this that show that blacks are twice as likely to have more than $30,000 in debt when they uh, leave their, their graduate career or leave their graduate programs. And um, among those who earn uh, degrees at HBCUs, they have higher levels of debt as well. So I think when we think about there's it's hard to disconnect entirely debt with career pathways because that's likely to make to help inform those sorts of decisions that students are making. So I think I just want to have you keep this in the back of your head as we continue down um, this discussion and, and move into some of the factors that could be contributing to the continued disproportionate low disproportionately low representation of women in some of these career pathways. Thank you. Yeah, I'm coming. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna go on. Thank you, Courtney. Um, I'd like to invite the other two panelists to take a seat up front so that I can quickly introduce them and we can get on with the discussion. All the panelists have already told me they want as much time to talk as possible. Some of them may or may not have paid me for extra minutes, so <laughs> I want to uh, get this going. Uh, like I did with Courtney, I'm going to do just a bare bones introduction uh, for each of them because the details about them are in your program and that way we can get started. Uh, Carrie Ann Rockamore, to the right of Courtney, obviously, is the president and CEO of the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity, NCFDD, as it's known, is an independent professional, professional development, mentoring, and training community that serves more than 65,000 graduate students, postdocs, and faculty members in the U.S. Um, at the end, we have Michael Foyer. Uh, he's Dean and Professor of Education at the George Washington University Graduate School of Education and Human Development. He's also president of the National Academy of Education. Among his research interests are the economics of education, the uses and misuses of standardized education, and the nature of scientific research in education. Uh, so I'd like to begin with a question for Carrie Ann. Uh, when I looked at Courtney's slides, I couldn't help but zone in on the one about how um, women and blacks are most likely to leave uh, STEM careers. And this made me think of how universities often articulate that diversifying uh, their STEM departments is a goal, but then there's a disconnect between that goal and the climate in which faculty members work. And can you talk a little bit about what some of the common climate problems are, how they contribute to the lack of diversity in STEM, and uh, which climate-related issues colleges have to address right away uh, if they're preparing to recruit underrepresented minorities and women? So thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, 
And, you know, before I talk specifically about climate, I always feel like um, it's important to kind of be explicit that uh, it always feels like when we talk about diversifying that there's really kind of two parallel projects going on. So there's this project of uh, structural change, of organizational change that's really about policies and procedures and best practices. And then there's this project about individuals on the ground, on the tenure track right now. And what's interesting to me is uh, these two projects operate at completely different time frames. And so uh, when we talk about what are the kind of policies and procedures, um, what are the kind of organizational structural changes that we can make, this is a really long-term project, right? And part of what we see and part of what we hear over and over again, I'm on a different campus working with faculty every single week. Um, what we hear is from faculty who are on the ground right now who, quite frankly, um, if you ask them, uh, are certain things in place? Yes. Um, there was a lot of things that went into recruiting them to campus. And yet what's interesting to me, what often gets left out of the conversation is what happens to faculty once they get on campus? So we spend all this huge amount of time, energy, and resources in the recruitment project, which is great. For me, the question is, what do we actually do to support people to really help them thrive once they're on campus? What do we do? And I think a lot of times what happens is that um, we match them with a mentor. We say, oh, Professor so-and-so is going to be your mentor. Good luck. <laughs> and uh, we hope for the best. And we imagine that some uh, magical mentoring relationship is going to happen where everything they need to know and everything they need to navigate the environment is going to take place. And uh, my own experience in working with uh, 65,000 people is that that doesn't happen. And that, in fact, when people start thinking about challenges, when people start talking about navigating the space, when people start talking about the kind of things that keep them from thriving, um, the resolution to those things isn't happening in a single mentor relationship. So uh, let me be even more blunt. Um, all tenure track faculty face certain challenges, right? So uh, it's hard to get tenure, right? No one tells you a checklist, do X, Y, and Z, and then you'll get it. Um, there's a lot of ambiguity. There's uh, ever escalating expectations. There's lots of time pressures. That's for everybody. That's just a structural part of being on the tenure track. But if you talk to underrepresented faculty, talk to people with intersectional identities, I like that way of saying it, uh, what ends up happening is you hear a whole additional layer of concerns, things like, um, you know, everyone struggles to find time for research, but if you are the only fill in the blank in your department, guess what? Every committee, every anything that needs some visible diversity, you get asked. Um, things from the admission video to parents weekend um, to any committee having anything to do with diversity. And time that is spent on these wonderful activities is also time not spent on research, right? Um, we also find that even though it's 2014 and we're supposed to be post-race and post-gender and post all these other things. The reality is that when students come into a classroom, particularly in STEM fields, they have an imagination of professor, and it's usually not a woman or a person of color. And when people come into a classroom and there's a little disjuncture, uh, people start asking questions. Are you the professor, <laughs> right? Do you have a PhD? Have you ever taught this class before? My personal favorite, uh, one time someone asked me, not only do you have a PhD, but can I see it? <laughs> yeah, I know. I've got it tucked in my bra just in case. Um, <laughs> the point here is this. Um, what this tends to do for people is um, it makes people feel like they don't have the benefit of the doubt that they have to prove themselves. And what we see among faculty over and over again mm -hmm. is people spend disproportionately high amounts of time on teaching. And time spent on teaching is time not spent on research and writing. And maybe the third and last pressure I'll talk about that people face is this sense of, um, the sense of isolation, the sense of a lack of collegial support, the sense of, yes, I've been matched with a mentor, um, but I'm not getting what I need. And more importantly, I don't have any sponsors. And mentors are great. They provide you with information and resources. But a sponsor is somebody who actually uses their power and influence on your behalf 
behind closed doors when people are talking about you and you're not there. They're those people who shape the story about who you are and what you do. And so I mention these things to really differentiate, yes, there are pressures that everyone faces on the tenure track. There are also this additional set of pressures that come from being the only or one of few. And what we see them manifested most frequently as is in time. <laughs> that people really, their time is so pressed because they're getting all of these different sort of things coming in from so many different places. And that that time crunch tends to result in pressures around um, building the type of scholarly reputation, the type of work um, that is needed to get tenure. So I mentioned all these things because I hope uh, that we'll talk a little bit more um, I know we'll talk for sure about sort of the structural project around um, diversifying the professoriate, but I hope we also uh, include in the conversation and expand into the conversation, how do we actually meet people's needs? And if we take seriously this idea that um, women and faculty of color have an additional set of uh, pressures, how do we put things in place above and beyond, here's a mentor, go have coffee, I hope you figure it out. How do we actually put meaningful things in place that help people to work at their highest potential to help them to really thrive, not only on the tenure track, but even more importantly, post-tenure, as people move into leadership positions and move into positions um, where they're able to make significant change on their campus. Thank you, Carrie Ann. Uh, Michael, I want to um, follow with a question for you, if I could, uh, and this has a little bit to do with putting things in place. I am curious about what kinds of policies uh, and practices that you would like to see universities put in place uh, to make it so that underrepresented minorities and women have an equal opportunity to uh, succeed in STEM and academia. Are there things that you're thinking, thinking of that would be you know, good moves? Well, thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. Let me put in a, a kind word about Courtney Tannenbaum, first of all. This is a wonderful <laughs> bit of research, and it's not surprising that uh, Courtney represents, in some ways, two of my favorite institutions in the world, GW and AIR, and it's a lovely combination. <laughs> Soon, Courtney will have her doctoral degree from us, and uh, she makes us very proud. This is great work. Um, that's a really interesting question, Audrey, and... Um, since becoming dean, I have uh, devoted a lot of time to at least uh, thinking about the issues of diversity, both on the faculty of the Ed School and more generally at uh, GW. It, there is no simple answer to this question. Um, it is uh, part of my mission, part of our mission in the graduate school to uh, remember, first of all, the rather remarkable history of the American educational system's commitment to diversity, um, which of course over more than a century was way ahead of the rest of the world with of course one quite glaring exception, and that was uh, how long it took for us uh, to recognize the, the fundamental stain in our history that was only starting to get corrected in the mid-50s thanks to the Brown decision and, and what followed. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, if you think about this problem in a historical context, you should actually uh, find some source of optimism. Uh, in the early 1950s, the percentage of Americans who were enrolled in high school uh, was in the 70s, high 70s, high 70s. 75, 78% of American 15 to 17 year olds were enrolled in traditional high school in the early 1950s. Uh, our European competitors, those that are doing better than us these days on international tests and the like, were in the low teens. So the idea of inclusion and opening the doors of education to the masses was actually something that was more or less invented in the United States and that in some ways um, we should continue to look back on with a certain amount of, of, uh, of pride uh, and also look back on as a source of evidence about uh, what the future holds for us. It takes commitment, it takes political will, and it takes a combination of policy at, at the level of government uh, and decision making, and very importantly, and what you've just heard from Carrie Ann is, is so significant, 
it takes commitment at the institutional level as well. Um, so what we're doing at, um, uh, you know, in our, we have, GW is a private university here in Washington, as you all know, and it's uh, something like about 10,000 undergraduates and 15,000 graduate students distributed in a number of uh, professional programs. Um, we uh, had a reputation for being one of the highest uh, tuition charging institutions. I'm glad to say that our sticker price is no longer number one uh, in the country. Uh, but more importantly, and this is actually quite significant, uh, the net price at GW is remarkably competitive. That is, we don't even make it into the top 100, if I remember the data correctly. Net price is, of course, what, what the average student pays at GW after you account for financial aid. And that's an indication that the university is very strongly committed uh, to the opening of opportunities uh, for uh, young people to come to school, uh, even if they don't have uh, the full economic wherewithal of some of their colleagues. So one thing that we're emphasizing is um, an attempt to increase the resource base from which we can provide that kind of financial aid. A second thing we're doing is actually um, participating now in a university-wide um, initiative, uh, partly at the encouragement of the White House. Uh, our president, Steve Knapp, was invited to a summit at the White House and was asked to participate in a nationwide effort to rethink the university's role, that is the all the universities, but ours also, um, in providing uh, better opportunities and access uh, for minority students and for economically less advantaged students. Um, so we have a task force underway, and we are looking at issues related to cost, issues related to admissions criteria, and very significantly, again, uh, piggybacking on Carrie Ann here, um, issues related to what we can be doing with respect to mentoring, uh, guiding, advising, and uh, sustaining uh, the, uh, the pool of students who start out with us uh, and in, with, with particular interest in uh, the STEM fields, although it's not limited just to STEM uh, either. Uh, I want to say one more word about the context uh, for all of this. First of all, you know, I, I, I was rereading the uh, Courtney slides and some of the data, and it reminds me that um, unlike all the other problems in education, uh, this one is complicated. Um, and, and the data don't, don't necessarily point to a particular uh, solution strategy. Um, so, for example, 70% of men and 65% of women are somehow stalled with respect to uh, STEM careers. Um, you could look at that and say, you know, that's, that, that differential is something that we ought to be focusing on. On the other hand, it's not a huge gap. So that should give us some sense that, okay, maybe, maybe we don't have a, a, a problem that is so daunting here that we should just uh, give it up. It, it seems like we're within reach of thinking about ways to, to reach some more um, equity there. Um, the fact that among new PhDs, there are actually more women than men, it seems, going into academic careers, also quite interesting, somewhat surprising in some ways, uh, but I would put that in the category of some interesting and possibly good news about efforts that have uh, been made over the years. Um, I don't actually know the data about how, how other countries <coughs> are doing in this regard, but my hunch is that uh, years and years of emphasizing diversity and inclusion and access has actually had some positive effect in the way we are managing institutions and in the way we are uh, coping with the differences that people come to school with, home backgrounds, family backgrounds, economic circumstances, 
women bearing children and the like, uh, and trying to manage even with all of those um, challenges. Michael, um, let me yes. let you um, come back to the nuances of the, sure. the data in a few. I want I need to move on. Um, Courtney, uh, part of uh, the issue of moving through the pipeline is you actually have to you know, get get the job so you can start the movement. And uh, I want you to talk about the role that implicit and explicit biases play uh, in the way people evaluate job candidates and how those biases impede uh, efforts to diversify a STEM. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So there's been um, a fair amount of research, and, and we haven't had an opportunity to, to look at this ourselves yet uh, at AIR. But what has been informing our work, and this gets to what, one of Carrie Ann's comments where she was talking about when you enter into that classroom and you expect one thing and see mm -hmm. another. Well, the same thing happens with, um, with candidates who are, who are getting hired into positions. So uh, there's, you, know, you can look at a piece of paper and see two people with very mm -hmm. similar qualifications or these same qualifications as some studies have shown with uh, different names. And depending on that name as opposed to what is actually in the, in the application, uh, different hiring decisions are made. And there's been a number of studies that have come out recently about that where they have provided faculty and STEM faculty and hiring committees with applications that are in resumes that are exactly the same except for the name at the top. And the name at the top ends up, that's a, that's a male name, ends up getting the job and the female does not. Or the male gets a higher salary offering and the female does not. And again, these are exactly the same. So we're seeing these biases. And these, these are decisions being made by both female and male faculty. And this is where I think the implicit biases come in, that this is, these are hard, as, as Michael was saying. These are, this is a very complex problem. We're talking about changing, we're talking about real mind shifts and who does science, who people see as scientists, and, uh, and who they expect to see and, and, and who they welcome into their circles. And they're not always conscious biases. We all hold them. We all are experience them, depending on our different identities. And, and again, this gets back to the intersectional identity, too. And there's one thing about being made, perhaps a, a white woman walking into an interview versus um, a racial ethnic minority woman, or a woman that someone may suspect is pregnant. Mm -hmm. and, and how does that affect, uh, even if, again, unconsciously or, or more subtly, how does that affect who is making hiring decisions and, and how they assess the candidate and whether that candidate belongs in their community or, or should belong or can thrive there? So. Okay. Uh, Carrie Ann, you've already mentioned that, uh, you know, pairing a faculty member with a mentor and saying, you know, see you later is, is not really the answer uh, that we need for what, what we've been talking about. Uh, and I, but I want to talk about mentors and, and have you kind of address that and also talk about uh, how underrepresented minorities and women can kind of push past the barriers that exist uh, for finding mentors. They don't see people who look like them. They don't uh, really know where to turn, et cetera. How can they push past those barriers and kind of get the mentoring network that they need and have that be something fruitful? Uh, for them. Sure. So um, I think there's a couple problems with, uh, you know, I honestly, one of the first things that we, uh, when we work with people is we say, stop using the word mentoring. <laughs> because um, the problem with using the word mentoring is it becomes this giant slush bucket um, <laughs> that we use this term instead of saying what we actually need, right? And so uh, people say, I need mentoring, I need a mentor. But what actually do you need? And when you scratch a surface and you ask people, what do you actually need? They say things like, I need to figure out how to get an NIH grant. I need to figure out how to manage uh, some dissension that has come up in my lab. I need to figure out how to teach a 300-person course when I've never taught a class bigger than 30 people. Um, and ultimately, I think you know things like, how do I um, establish authority in the classroom. Uh, all these sorts of things are really specific. And when we walk around sort of saying, I need mentoring, um, what ends up happening is that sometimes we get pushed in the direction of a person. And somehow with the idea that that person is going to be able to fill in all these different blanks for us, instead of saying, what I actually need <coughs> is somebody who already has the thing that I want. <laughs> Somebody who, if I want an NIH grant, um, it doesn't make sense to go to a mentor who's assigned to me who's never had one. Um, they may have some interesting things to say, but it'd be much more powerful if I went directly to someone who already has what I want. And in the same way, um, I know when I first started uh, when I first started as a professor, I was 26 years old. I'm four foot ten. I have propensity to wear my hair in a ponytail. Um, my biggest problem was establishing authority in the classroom. And I remember I was matched with a mentor, um, someone in a chemistry department, a very senior faculty member. And I said, "Hey, um, 
he said, well, how are you doing? What's going on? Where are you stuck? I said, well, I'm really struggling to establish authority in the classroom. And he just sort of looked at me with this blank stare. He said, you don't have to do anything. Just walk in and start talking. <laughs> and of course, for him, that was very much the case. But then he took a step back and he said, oh, you know what? I don't know what you're talking about because I've never had that experience, but I can tell from the look on your face, this is totally salient to you. And so what we need to do is find you somebody um, who is tiny, who's won teaching awards, who clearly knows how to establish authority in the classroom. Let's get that connection together and let's let, we don't have to call that person your mentor. You just need to know what you need and be really clear about asking for it. And I think what tends to happen is we set up mentoring programs without realizing that if we ask 10 different people what mentoring is, what does it look like when you're mentoring? Um, what behaviors are going on? How do we measure if it's effective or not? Who's getting it or not getting it? You'll get 10 different responses. Um, it's also the case that we imagine, um, you know, mentoring is really, I think, time intensive, invisible, and unrewarded labor. And some people are really into <laughs> uh, time intensive, invisible, unrewarded labor, and some people aren't. Um, and so we imagine it's gonna happen, but a lot of times it doesn't happen. And I think biggest problem of all is that um, we somehow imagine that people can only be mentored by people in their specific field. And what we see over and over again is that when people are transitioning from being a graduate student to a faculty member, the kinds of issues that are, they're struggling with on a day-to-day -day basis are not about their science. They're about managing their time. They're about managing relationships. They're about managing their perfectionism. They're about um, figuring out how things work on campus. They're the kinds of things that, in fact, um, don't necessarily need to be specifically responded to by somebody in one subfield. In fact, people have to get a lot of things established and settled before they get to the point of wanting to have a very substantive, specific conversation um, and need very particular types of advice with people in their field. And so I'm not putting these out as like sort of a dichotomous relationship. It's just I think we need to fundamentally rethink mentoring because ultimately this model that most people have in mind, this single mo uh, mentor model, this guru mentor model, not only does it not work for most people most of the time, it's not even what I would consider uh, a healthy model because it's a dependency model. People are going to one person over and over and over again for all of their needs getting met. When in fact, if we start to think about mentoring um, as identifying what people need, not demonizing the fact that people have needs or suggesting that having needs um, is somehow uh, makes you less than or incompetent, but that it's normal to have a wide variety of needs when you transition from one role to the next. If we can identify those needs, the obvious question is where is the best, most efficient way to get those needs met. And it's almost always somebody who already has mastered the thing that you need, who already has the thing that you need. And whether we call that person a mentor or not, to me is completely irrelevant. Um, what matters so much more is that people are surrounded by a wide network of people for whom they can pick up the phone at any time, knock on the door at any time. And quite frankly, these people don't even have to be at the person's institution and um, if I may say one more thing. One more thing. <laughs> uh, I think that sometimes what we don't realize is that when people are new in a role, they have certain types of needs that they do not feel comfortable bringing to a person who has power over them. And let me say it differently. If I know that someone is voting on my tenure, um, I'm going to be real careful about what I say. <laughs> what vulnerabilities I reveal, what questions that I ask, because they could be interpreted in a wide variety of ways. And so I think we also have this assumption that people need mentors not only in their field, but in, on their campus. And so I think part of rethinking mentoring is not only pulling apart this guru mentor model, but also starting to understand that part of the way we get people's needs met, who are solo faculty, who are underrepresented faculty, 
is by plugging into this idea of external mentoring, um, plugging into this idea that mentoring needs can be met outside of one's campus so that the time that I spend with senior faculty in my discipline and my field is really focused on the substance of the work and doesn't have to be around all these other things where I have need. Yes, please go ahead. Sure. No, I think um, Carrie Ann is bringing up a really good point. And the idea of, and just to kind of draw this back a little bit to these sorts of pathways for underrepresented minorities, um, women, racial ethnic minority women, mothers, is this, one, this idea of a wide network of mentors. Because if you don't have diversity, you don't have a wide network of mentors. Yeah. You have mentors who can speak to one thing or one or two things. So where does that student or that new faculty member go who has a three-year-old daughter? Yes who doesn't know how to navigate childcare, or if childcare is even something, I mean, we know all that, but we know that even when, when policies are in place like that, there's, oh, we have a childcare policy. Well, if you take that policy, what does that mean for my career? Is that actually, yes. I mean, maybe I'm getting some childcare, but then the rest of the faculty on campus or in my department are saying, she's not serious about her work. Um, and that doesn't mean that you should have a mentor who's telling you that, but the, more, the wider variety of mentors and the more diverse faculty department that you have, you're going to have mentors who have, can help you navigate through these different avenues or these pathways that you need and also serve as role models who have actually done it, have mm -hmm. successfully had children, have successfully become the first or second or third or fourth, hopefully, black woman at a fa in a STEM faculty department. And so um, I think this wide network is, is both a wide network and also you need to establish that wide network. And I think that's part of what we're talking about here is how do you get a wider network mm -hmm. of people who can serve as mentors in lots of different areas that a wide variety of students with lots of different backgrounds and experiences are experiencing and trying to move through in their pathways to becoming STEM faculty. Thank you, Courtney. I'd like to shift gears, if I could, to um, learn a little bit about what um, you on the panel think about who need to be the players uh, on a university campus who have to be involved and committed in efforts to diversify uh, STEM departments. Uh, maybe some of these people aren't the usual folks that you would think of, but I'm curious about who needs to be invested, who needs to be making it a priority, and what are the things that they need to be doing um, to signal that they're serious about the issue. This is not something that we um, you know, have written down on paper for everybody to see and nothing's happening. Uh, Michael, let me start with you on that. Yeah, well, that that's a... Again, that's a question that's very much on our minds. Uh, so who should be involved and how do, we, how do we send the right signals that this is such an important issue for us? And uh, I wish I had a formula to share on how to do this right. Uh, I, I do think it's a combination of, and this actually goes back to the mentoring thing in some ways, it, it's a combination of formal and informal mechanisms mm -hmm. that are really significant here. Um, formally, of course, we have uh, criteria that we use to recruit uh, new faculty or, for that matter, students. Uh, we have rules, uh, you know, thank God, we have rules that prevent us from at least consciously discriminating. Uh, I don't know about how we manage implicit biases and things, but that's, that's where... I think there has to be um, a willingness from the leadership uh, and role modeling from the leadership about the development of an atmosphere on the campus that really encourages uh, and facilitates the professional development generally, and then the professional development of our minority and women um, colleagues rather more specifically. Um, one example would be that in addition to, or maybe even instead of having a formal so-called mentor assigned to a new faculty member, what I try to do and what other colleagues of mine and deans and other ed schools around the country are trying to do is finding opportunities to pair early career faculty with more experienced faculty who share an interest in a particular line of research or who can then uh, benefit from this partnership as well. Not exactly to um, 
you know, to sort of extend the lowly status of graduate students, even to those who are newly appointed as faculty members. But it is to recognize that, for example, if you look at the success rates for externally sponsored research, uh, first, first time um, applicants for major grants have a pretty low probability of getting uh, an award the first time around. That probability increases to some extent if they are, if the proposal comes from some kind of a pairing of an early career mm -hmm. faculty with someone who has more stature and reputation in the field. And creating opportunities for those faculty at different stages of their career to work together and recognize that they both have something to gain from this, I think is a way to essentially uh, attack the problems of uh, isolation and inexperience that many early career faculty uh, come to their job with. I'm not sure if I'm being clear about this or maybe uh, overstating something that's abundantly obvious to everybody. But this is something that we worry about a lot. And, you know, to the extent that uh, we can find ways to, um, uh, you know, for, because I can look out over my entire faculty of roughly 75 uh, wonderful, hardworking people and think about possible couplings and pairings and triads of people and create incentives and opportunities for them to work together without necessarily uh, doing it from the standpoint of I want to have a group of, uh, you know, uh, one African American, one Hispanic, and one woman working together. That for me is, I think, not necessarily as effective a strategy as thinking about a problem area uh, and having people who care about it work on it together. Uh, actually, Courtney knows this, and we, we have, um, for example, we, we've decided to do a, a little more uh, dive, uh, deep diving into the problems of access and affordability in higher education, and we have a group of faculty uh, who are working on this together who represent different uh, levels of experience and prior reputation, as well as a diversity with respect to gender and race and ethnicity. And my hunch is, or my gamble is, that when those kinds of groups can be given incentives to work together, and the incentives are pretty clear, mm. you know, I mean, we're still in the academic world here, publishing, getting grants, uh, create and, and by the way, I, I added this this point you made, Carrie Ann, about whether mentoring is ever rewarded. Uh, actually, I I include that in my annual review of the faculty, uh, the extent to which uh, senior faculty have mm -hmm. have been generous in terms of their willingness and uh, to work with the early career faculty. So it, 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 these are, my short version of all of this is to think about the formal and the informal and to think about the incentive to work on interesting topics in research or developing new instructional ideas, new, new you know, sort of cross-disciplinary uh, experiences for our students and that will draw people and, you know, it's an irony in this business that in education and in psychology, we actually know more about the importance of uh, learning by doing than in many other fields, but we haven't actually figured out how to apply it to ourselves. Michael, let me stop you there at that yes. note and see if the other columnists have, um, the other have panelists. Also is sorry. people who like me talk too much. But that's <laughs> the other panelists have anything to add about who should be at the table and what signals they should um, show to show that you know we're serious about. Yeah, I mean, I just want to echo this idea about the formal and the informal, right? So um, clearly, uh, to make change requires sort of uh, people working on both these projects, right? So clearly, when we're talking about organizational change, about structural change, it requires people in leadership positions um, to really have a clear view of the types of policies and procedures that are going to make that change possible. It's also the case that a lot of the ugly happens on the ground. <laughs> 
uh, a lot of the problems happen on the ground. And so I always feel like one of the um, critical roles about sort of the individual project, this sort of cultivating and supporting faculty project, is sometimes we underestimate the importance of department chairs. <laughs> Um, because a really progressive department chair, a thoughtful department chair, a well-respected department chair um, is a person who sort of connects, right, um, this place between policy and culture, right? Um, because as you said, we can have all kinds of policies in place, but how is it interpreted if I actually take advantage of them, right? Um, how is it read if I actually use these policies? And I think in many ways, it's that department chair um, who really sees what's going on, sees sort of that nexus of policy and climate or policy and culture, and has that ability to sort of step in and to moderate that relationship. Um, I think it's also the case that uh, we see examples, I was just at UC Irvine uh, two weeks ago, uh, really using their NSF advance grant to create um, these uh, people in departments, in colleges, they call them <laughs> equity advisors, um, people who really serve as resources at the moments when um, things can go off the rails. So the equity advisors really looking at um, the hiring process, really being a resource to search committees on a hiring process, um, being a resource to faculty as they're uh, coming up for tenure, um, really serving in roles that they become a resource person. And of course, these equity advisors, um, it is a position, it's a role, right? It's a formal role, which means it's a way of recognizing the labor that goes into uh, creating equity in a department and really serving as that kind of moderator between um, the level of policy, of institutional policy and the culture on the ground. Okay, um, we're going to move to our question after question and answer portion after I um, ask Courtney to just say a little wrap up in, in by way of answering this question. Uh, I think a lot of times people think about these type of topics and think you know they're just kind of so lofty and we can't really wrap our arms around them, etc. And I uh, was wondering if you could take maybe a minute, two minutes, um, to share how you would explain to the general public what's at stake if we don't. Uh, diversify STEM fields, make the pathway, you know, something that people can send the end of. What's at stake if none of, you know, none of that happens? That's a really tough question. Oh, right. <laughs> there's a, I mean, I think there's a lot at stake. I mean, I think, as, as Michael said, we're seeing progress. I mean, we're seeing improved participation rates at different points of these pathways in this pipeline. But it really, it, it perpetuates such a cycle, and I think mm -hmm. that's the, the real danger is you get stuck in a cycle of, um, of inequity, and also in pockets where there is access and pockets where there's not. And we're seeing this all the way down. I mean, unfortunately, it starts so early. We can't, it starts so early in, in different communities and who is present in those communities and, and who people, who um, young girls and young boys and um, young students going through who they have access to, who they see doing certain things, who they see in the media doing certain things. Um, I mean, it's, it's pervasive. So I think it's, it's going to be quite a slog. <laughs> but it's an important one because um, I mean, our nation's demographics have changed. They continue to change. Um, continuing to rely on the same supply and the same pool of talent is not productive, and, um, and it's not sustainable. So uh, it needs to be addressed. And I think um, kind of circling back to there was something I wanted to add that I think we're all getting at here is what we're pushing to is um, and I think you've gotten that through the discussion, is that it's not just about critical mass either. I mean, mm -hmm. you can say, oh, well, our department is 50% women or 50% diverse. Well, if those people, if the culture itself is not changing, if these people have adapted or made themselves fit into a culture that is not sustainable, that is still not welcoming of diversity, it's not going to be helpful. So going to a mentor and saying, gosh, I don't know what to do in this situation, mm -hmm. Well, you're just going to have to adapt. I did it. I made these sacrifices. I decided not to have children, or I decided not to marry, or you know, I decided not to go down that path or pursue the research that really interests me in order to succeed, that's not helpful. Um, so I think we're talking about two different things, and I think sometimes those get conflated with like, well, if we hire five women, we'll be fine. Well, it depends on who those five women are and what they've had to do to get there. So I think that's just another piece of the puzzle. You can see me wanting to get in 45 on 45 seconds. 45 seconds. That's it. <laughs> The, the idea that we've made progress should not be misinterpreted as an excuse for becoming complacent. We may never be number one in the world in math and science, despite a lot of what the rhetoric says we would like to be. 
But we are getting close to being number one in the world in inequality. Mm -hmm. So the, the short answer to the question of what happens if we don't pay attention to this is that we will end up looking back and saying, what have we done? And how can we sustain this kind of a democracy having paid so little attention to this growing cancer of inequality? And even if the differences are relatively small and they seem sort of like manageable and we've made good progress, that should embolden us to keep working on it, not to say, okay, problem solved, next. Okay. All right, you all have been waiting patiently to ask questions. I really appreciate your patience. I want to thank the panelists um, for their, their remarks. As we move on uh, to the Q&A portion, there's two quick housekeeping things. Um, to our online audience, remember uh, to join the conversation by following at education underscore AIR and use the hashtag STEM diversity to send in questions to the panelists. If you're in-house with a question, raise your hand, wait for the microphone to come to you, and uh, please tell us your name and where you're from, and most importantly, be quick and to the point with your questions so we can get as many of them in as possible. Okay, the floor is open. I'll let you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Cam Zemek Adams. I'm from the U.S. Department of Education, and um, I have a two-part question. One is that last year I was at a talk where MIT talked about a structural change that they had made at their university around maternity leave mm -hmm. to consider maternity leave the same in the review as a sabbatical. And I just wondered if, especially, um, you know, you guys could talk a little bit about structural changes that you've seen across the country, things like that. And then the second part of the question is around um, post-tax, post-docs, and um, teaching track positions rather than research institutions. So Courtney, in your presentation, you talked about academic positions. My experience with a lot of my colleagues is that once women enter having having taken a maternity leave, they get caught in this endless cycle of postdocs or get placed in a teaching position, which might be valuable here, but it might not pay off in the long run. I wonder if you have any disaggregation in your data around um, academic positions, whether they were postdocs, teaching positions, or like research-based tenure track. Right, Thanks. okay, so I can answer that really quick quickly. In these briefs, these are relatively short, we didn't, um, we lumped just to get a sense of because, uh, and we haven't looked, although we could, uh, it does differentiate that way. We haven't looked at postdocs versus faculty. The data that we have would allow us to tell them whether or not they're take, they've taken a postdoc and if it's an academic institution. And because so many first academic positions begin in a postdoc, mm -hmm. um, we include that as an early career academic pathway. Um, or as one that if you don't take a postdoc, you're often disadvantaged. I mean, it's hard to, when I think that this is getting at your point of like mothers or, or taking maternity leave while you're on that. Once you cycle out of a postdoc early in your career or don't take one, it's very hard to get into an academic mm -hmm. track. And these are fast paced. I mean, that's why there's a lot of data to show that. Um, and we did focus when we talked about mothers, we talked about mothers of young children because mothers who have older children um, tend not to get quite as stuck. But those who have to take leave or who have those caretaking duties um, do get stalled. And they could, and it's not to say, I think we're trying not to say that teaching positions are bad or that nobody should go into teaching or that you shouldn't be at a community college or another college. It's more that um, it continues this sort of cycle. We just, we need equal representation all along so that um, rising, like, you, I mean, you can just see how when there's been studies that look at this, at the aspirations or, or the, even what we've been um, with people can, and I think this is a very, um, applicable or relevant term is to think about it as constrained choices. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of talk about, well, they just chose to do that path. You know, that's, that was their choice. They decided not to take that pathway. Well, maybe they decided to do that or they chose to do that, but did they do that because they didn't think the other career pathway was feasible or that it was unworkable because of the types of structural um, policies that are in place or barriers that would not allow them to pursue a family and a, a tenure track where they've had to say, um, well, I made these decisions, and there's been studies that show this too, I made decisions along the way that mm -hmm. to have only have one child or to have less children than I wanted or not to get married or not to do this because I wanted, I had to put my career first in order to make that happen. Um, so I'm not sure if that's really answering your question, but I, but I think uh, we do have those data, but we haven't disaggregated that way yet. But I think it's um, one we've been talking about is really what does, what does postdoc pathways look like for diff people of different, with different backgrounds and identities. And just to speak to the other part of the question, um, yeah, I think sort of the progression of, um, of policy is that not just making things available, but um, 
starting to impact how taking them is read and the consequences of taking them. So um, another example would simply be uh, that when people uh, take maternity leave, um, they're automatically given a rollback. They don't have to ask for it, right? Or their clock is automatically, so they don't have to ask for it. So it's this, you know, it's a nuanced sort of shift, but it's a shift um, like the example that you describe that takes it one step further, right? That takes the onus off of somebody that has to make uh, different types of judgments either to ask for something or how it's read on the back end, right? So that if I take it, I can't be punished for taking it um, in a way that might happen if there isn't something in place. Do you have another question? Uh, let's, can you go here and then you? Yeah, okay. She needs the microphone, yeah. Hi, uh, Laura Lee Davidson, QEM Network, Quality Education for Minorities Network. Okay. Um, just adding something, the career, there's a career life balance initiative mm. on the way through the National Science Foundation, and uh, it's rolling through the federal agencies and the um, institutions who receive funding, which are most of the higher education institutions. The career life balance initiative allows stopouts uh, for both the uh, mother and father. <laughs> It allows postdocs to um, take some time to get their lives in order <laughs> as well as their uh, research experiences without penalties. So I think what uh, you probably saw last year was a career life balance initiative at MIT, but a lot of the institutions are starting to do that and the federal agencies who fund the major research are driving that effort and trying to share um, ideas on how to do that effectively so that the institutions and the federal agencies all take that into account with grantees and, and with the uh, postdocs. And it was created to address some of the issues faced by women and um, other groups in terms of equity um, uh, and mobility in, in, in academe. Okay, up here. After this question, I'm going to take one from our online audience. Someone needs to ask you something. Hi, um, I'm Rita Kirstein here at AIR and also periodically an adjunct at GW. So I walk in both worlds. Mm -hmm. um, so I have some kind of a two pronged but related question. I mean, a lot of the discussion today seemed to focus on how we fit underrepresented minorities into a structure rather than changing the structure itself. Um, and there's a whole, there's every week a new book comes out on changing, you know, higher ed and crises in academia, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think we all probably agree that higher ed will be changing, is changing, but um, that's not what I heard today. It's like, how do we fit women and underrepresented minorities into an existing structure, <coughs> excuse me, which is going to change? The other part is, and I know we're focusing on mostly the graduate education to academe pipeline today, if we're really going to increase the pipeline um, of women in underrepresented groups in higher ed, we've got to look to not our research one universities, um, but we have to look at the whole range of colleges and universities from community colleges, HBCUs, HSIs, teaching colleges, et cetera, um, and the role of faculty in those institutions um, I believe needs some attention. I'd like our panelists, um, maybe particularly Carrie Ann, to talk a little bit about what she sees going on in the non-research universities to address these issues. Yeah, and you know, I always like to start by sort of talking about sort of there's a structural change process and then there's the individual process um, because quite frankly, that structural change process is a long-term process. And in fact, um, I couldn't agree with you more um, that this short-term, how do people make it work, how do they navigate what is, really isn't of the moment thing, right? Um, while we sort of work for these broader changes to happen. And I think when we look past just uh, research intensive universities, what we see is very similar patterns, right? So we see um, similar demographic patterns. We see uh, people's day to day, what they do as work as a faculty member, the proportionality of it is, is different and is adjusted. Um, and in some ways, uh, we face the same sort of tension, right? Which is uh, people are trying to make it work with what is, and people are trying to imagine forward um, how things could actually change. And so, you know, uh, 
of our membership, we have uh, people represented from all different types of institutions. And it's amazing how similar their conversations are. It's amazing when they get together, the sorts of pressures, constraints um, that they experience. Again, proportionally they're different because how they're evaluated and what is their work um, is different. And yet, at the core, at the fundamental level, uh, people are still struggling with uh, the kinds of barriers that are gendered, the kind of barriers that are related to race, the kind of uh, gender, kind of barriers that are particularly for women um, related to um, what it means to have a life and work. And ultimately, um, and ultimately, you know, this broader sense of what is has to change. Uh, because this idea that we see motherhood as some thing that we have to work around um, or this thing that we have to develop policies so people can manage as opposed to being this is what you know humans reproduce. <laughs> um, <laughs> this isn't like some weird wacky thing I'm trying to do. Um, this is sort of part of uh, what happens in life. But at every end of the spectrum, babies are born, people die, people get sick, people get in the sandwich of elder care and child care. Um, and instead of imagining that these are these things that we have to push off to the side and manage, um, really rethinking what it means to have a campus, to have a workplace that encompasses humans, that encompasses the human experience, and becomes a place where people can both thrive as a scientist and as a parent. Could I add to that just a little bit? Because I think that's, um, I think Rita's point is a really good one, and, and I and I hope it wasn't, when, that's kind of what I was trying to get at with the critical mass. It's not that helpful to diversify if you're diversifying yeah. color and gender, but not um, commitment to different ways of doing. And I, and I think that's where, or that is where I was trying to go with that, is that I think it's, it's both these, as Carrie was saying, there's these sort of structural longer term changes in what's happening on the ground. And I think those can be blended a little bit where what's happening on the ground is slow, or, or hopefully building in, if you build in people who have different identities, different responsibilities, and can be role models and help create even just minor changes or on the ground changes to who's doing what and how it's being done, that will spread out to a larger cultural change and these sorts of mind shifts we have to have about what is doing, what doing science means, what the work looks like, how you manage that work, um, and manage it or integrate it, I guess, with, with personal and, and your professional life and your personal life so that people coming up through, the, through these pathways and starting in these early careers, whichever, whatever level of institution or academic or non-academic career that they're in, they are reshaping how that looks for new generations, mm -hmm. and that is going to be, so I think these two, they're almost like interlocking circles, because you yeah. can't do one without the other. So it's trying to draw in with your new, and really support those new people coming in and, and build a new culture and build a new <laughs> way of doing work and a new commitment to doing work and personal life and, and all of those things so that the culture can start, can shift along with those structural changes and you don't get policies on the books that aren't enacted or aren't implemented or that are avoided. Um, I think that needs to happen simultaneously. Can I just jump in on this for one second? I have a slightly different answer on this, Rita. I, uh, I, you know, the idea of um, hitting the pause button until we figure out how to restructure higher education is a fascinating uh, question. I'm not sure uh, I actually would want to be the one to visualize what this new structure might one day actually look like. Um, but in the short term, there are people who really quite legitimately, their lives can be substantially improved even with what might appear to be rather more marginal or incremental, incremental changes in the existing structure. And I don't think we should, you know, uh, somehow defer, uh, for example, a policy to enable um, new mothers on campus to have a facility for daycare, for breastfeeding. We're doing that at GW, by the way. It's a really interesting project. Um, whether the structure of higher education is going to change fundamentally, and trust me, all the deans and all the presidents and all the vice presidents, that's what keeps them up at night. They're worrying about all this. But in the meantime, we're trying to make access easier, better, more productive. We're trying to figure out ways to motivate and to, to create um, an atmosphere in which 
people who may have been excluded for all kinds of structural reasons are welcomed and are able to succeed, including new mothers, including uh, young people, or uh, for that matter, any people who, who happen to come with uh, less privilege. Um, you know, it's the, the structure isn't perfect, and it is changing, but I, I'm, I'm for figuring out ways to, uh, to, to make changes within what we've got now uh, for the sake of improving the lives of a lot of the people who, who we, we want to work with. Uh, let's go back to the floor, then I'll come back to the online question uh, here. <laughs> then let's go here next. Hi, um, I'm Reba Bandabadai. I'm a AAAS fellow over in the Senate um, this year. And um, we've heard a lot here about discussions about how to improve things for people once they've actually gotten a job. I would like to hear about how you get the job. I would like to hear about how we disincentivize universities from hiring armies of adjuncts uh, to teach, especially women who are and minorities who are second in a two-body problem and who are you know, married to another person and they can't, they are not portable and so they get stuck in an endless cycle. And I don't mean part-time adjuncts like you're doing another job, I mean full-time adjuncts trying to cobble together. How do we stop universities from doing that and actually hire more permanent faculty or at least lectureship type faculty uh, on multi-year contracts is that if that would be a way to deal with that problem or at least start on dealing with that problem um, and how once uh, we look at hiring committees, how do we do things to encourage those hiring committees to not uh, only focus on people who clearly worked 100 hour weeks and let the wife or whatever take care of the home front or didn't have those things, but instead look at hiring committees in, and having them look at the totality of people's experience and hiring on the basis of actually you know, having that work-life balance and therefore bringing that experience to the faculty. Before someone answers, we have about five minutes, so let's be mindful. I think we can get one more in if we. I see you, Carrie. Well, no, it would. It would um, unfortunately, Carrie. it would take seven minutes to solve the problem of the adjuncts. And Who's the got the best? <laughs> so yeah, I'll that's pass a whole on different this one for panel. now. But I want to follow up with you. I and see talk you, Carrie. Can you do two and a half, Carrie? <laughs> Three? Yeah, I mean, it's a really. It's, it's a deep question. Yeah, I mean, this is. I know, yeah, I know you were, but, but and literally, women. this is the problem, right? So we're talking about um, we have this, you know, structural shift in um, tenure track versus adjunct positions, right? So what's that hiring pool, right? The number of jobs is smaller. The number of people competing mm -hmm. for them larger. Uh, the assumptions that are built in, um, you know, when you have a really big competitive pool, right? Um, this is when some of these biases start to come out. So yeah, there are things we can do. We can train search committee members in um, recognizing and not, you know, getting into implicit bias. Um, but there's this reality, right? The door closes on the search committee and what happens in that room and the conversations, again, if somebody's not at the table, to redirect that, somebody who's a respected member of the, of the conversation, um, it's very hard, even if we know what an implicit bias looks like, even if we know um, cognitively what we're not supposed to do, conversations happen and take a different place. And this is why it is so critically important to have people who are healthy and uh, doing work that is respected among their colleagues and tenured, because those are the people sitting at the table who shift the conversation, um, who make sure that the kinds of things that um, get through don't get through. Well, I think, and I mean, it's a different way of looking at this, this problem, but given that there are, I mean, there, there's not availability, the availability of tenure track jobs are small, and that's a reality. So another part of this problem or a challenge, or what Another way to kind of think about this is to think about how are graduate students getting mentored, yes. getting advised, what kind of career advice are they getting, and who's available to, for them to go to to give them career advice that is not academic career advice, that can show them the different possibilities and opportunities that are available to them. And that's not to say that, so that they know that they aren't just have an academic track. And maybe that's not a feasible track. So someone who can give them, like, this may be what you want to pursue, and we can help you pursue that. But here's the reality of the job market, and these are other opportunities and possibilities and actually serve as a real guide and network and not say, well, if it's non-academic, I don't know who to turn to, I don't have a network there, and I can't help you. So I think it's also just having a broader picture of what, a we've focused a lot on faculty here, 
in the academic market, but there's a whole other market out there that offers real possibilities and opportunities for people to show their skills and be in highly visible STEM positions. Mm -hmm. Let's take our last question here. It's gonna be a short question so you can get more <laughs> answer time. Okay. Monica Villalta, I'm Director of Diversity and Inclusion here at the American Institute for Research. So this question is mostly for you, Carrie. So we're talking, and I hear you both talking about formal and informal. And here at AIR, we're looking, for example, at our workforce statistics, our representation rates, et cetera, et cetera. But when you're talking about that informal, um, do you have a set of indicators of success that you are really sharing through the field in your work? And is there a place where we can find that? Yeah, I'm so, talking about the cultural transformation piece. Yeah, so. you know, I'll just say that uh, for us, for our organization, um, we have a couple metrics that we look at. We look at um, do people who go through our programs increase their productivity? Do they increase their work-life balance? <clears throat> do they um, reduce their isolation? Do they expand their mentoring networks, right? So we keep our, those are metrics that matter to us. And part of the reason that we keep them is so that we can have people start asking, when you have a mentoring program, when you have this, that, or the other, how do you measure success, right? Um, we mentor in a very specific way, in a way that is completely designed to increase productivity and to increase work-life balance. So we want people to um, thrive, and by thrive we mean to have explosive productivity and have a life. And again, I think if we want that, we have to be able to measure it. We have to be able to measure, is the type of mentoring that we do, um, does it actually work? And I think when we start asking what works and how we can measure it, uh, what ends up happening is we start seeing, oh, some things work for some people, some things don't work, and what we imagine and expect and hope works actually isn't working that great. And I would be remiss if I didn't say that I brought some cards with me, in case you're interested, <laughs> we're at facultydiversity.org, and I left the cards on the table on the way out. Okay, um, that's going to conclude our panel discussion for today. Uh, the video of the event and Courtney's PowerPoint presentation will be uh, posted on AIR.org soon. Uh, let's give a round of applause to our panel. Thank you. And I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, please enjoy the rest of your day.